So today we are going to have this panel to talk about some of the research that's gone on in student learning. And uh, we, we have with us three people here today. We have Jim Amos from the National Science Foundation, Nancy Diulio from the Department of Biology, and Bob Brown from the Department of Physics. And I will, uh, the, the, uh, that'll be, the order of speakers will be Nancy first, then Bob, then uh, Jim. I will introduce, give the biography of each person before they speak. So first, let me start with Nancy. Nancy has been at CASE for the last 10 years, and I have known her for pretty much most of that time. And Nancy is an extremely impressive person. I've been involved with her. She was, she and Bob also were one of the learning, uh, learning fellows in the program I just spoke about. And Nancy is an extremely thoughtful person. I've been with her on many committees, and she's always worth listening to. Uh, she really thinks about things. And <laughs> Uh, what has impressed me most is, apart from her thoughtfulness, she clearly has a very empathetic personality that's really sensitive to what students are saying and what they're thinking. And I think that's really a hallmark of a great teacher. Uh, she earned a BS in chemistry from Carnegie Mellon uh, University and a PhD in biochemistry from the Pennsylvania State University in 1992. And as a faculty member in the biology department, uh, Nancy teaches one of the required core courses for the biology majors, cells and proteins. And she also teaches the electives in microbiology and the microbiology laboratory. These courses include student-centered learning activities in a large lecture environment, which is a challenging environment to teach in. Uh, Nancy has been named a National Academy's Education Mentor in the Life Sciences for work with faculty at the National Academies of Su Summer Institute on Undergraduate Biology Education. Her current research interest is the impact of learning opportunities outside of class on student achievement. So the forum will be, in the format will be in each person will speak for 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Okay, Nancy. Uh, why, uh, thank you, Mano, for the very kind introduction, and um, thank you to uh, the research showcase organizers, and Jim Bader in particular, for putting together this particular panel discussion today. So, um, Wow, I hope that I'm worth listening to today. <laughs> I'll try my best. So I want to talk about um, a couple of uh, interests that I have that seem disparate at first, but I think actually go hand in hand, and there are a lot of synergies across these two different interests. And they're all sort of centered around teaching for student learning, although I feel somewhat dissatisfied at this point with the information that I've gathered that it's really giving me insight into my student learning, but I think I'm beginning to get closer to understanding my student learning. So what I want to talk about, oops, there we go, are um, two sort of big projects I've been working on. And one of them is this uh, math science partnership project that I've been working on with uh, Jim Bader and with uh, Bill Batters, who's here here today, with the Cleveland School District, where we've been working with high school teachers and um, working with them in ways that we hope help improve their own teaching. And what's been interesting is that the six years I've spent working with the, that group of individuals has really begun to influence my own teaching and some of the things that I do in my own classroom. So I've learned a tremendous amount from those high school teachers and it's made me much more reflective on some of my own practice. And then secondly, I want to share with you some preliminary data I have from an ongoing study of student outcomes using active learning in an introductory biology course. And the course I'm going to talk about is the one uh, Mono mentions, that cells and proteins course. So first, the MSP. So in the phase one of this particular project, uh, what I've been involved in is we have some high school teachers on the Case campus in the summer, and those teachers teach uh, courses in physical science, chemistry, math, and biology, and they're divided into cohorts based on their content area. I've been working with the biology group, and the biology group, we've been focus, focusing on teaching and learning using inquiry-based methods of teaching and learning. And so to prepare for this, we had to develop a set of inquiry-based lab activities around various content goals from the high school biology curriculum. And the first 
uh, really eye-opening experience was to really think through what were sort of inquiry-based lab activities that could address some of the difficult content issues that our high school biology teachers take. And so each year we would develop some new activities, refine some old ones, and so that process has been an iterative process that's been very informative for me in just thinking about what it means to teach using inquiry as a teaching method. Um, so here's an example of a, of a lab activity that uh, we've been using that's sort of come out of this. So what we do with the biology teachers when they come in, we really have a couple of goals, and one goal is to help them refresh and deepen their content knowledge. But another goal is to help them think about their own teaching practice and help them recognize that discovery is a really important part of student learning. And so we try and come up with lab activities that are gonna be new activities that teachers haven't done before where they can experience that discovery moment themselves and, and feel what that's like to learn in that way and then we can have a discussion about how they can bring that really exciting feeling to their own students. So in this activity, we use this little protus that swims around and it'll eat up little globs of ink. And these organisms eat up the little globs of ink and you can watch them under the microscope and it's kind of fun because they're swimming about with their cilia and so on. So we have the teachers make some observations of these particular protists and then ask some questions about the feeding behavior that they are observing. Once they have established a list of questions, things they would like to know more about around this particular observation, we ask them to propose some hypotheses and design some experiments to answer those questions. This takes some time. We usually spend about two full days and have them first make their observations, propose some hypotheses, design some experiments, carry out those experiments, see what kind of data they get. We allow them the time to say, oh, you know, that wasn't quite the right experiment to answer this question. Let's do this a different way and so on so that they're really immersed in this activity. Now, we're not so much uh, concerned that they understand this organism or this particular behavior, but they really uncover for themselves the, the process of scientific exploration and they really enjoy asking their own question and getting data that answers that question. Then we can structure other activities that they may do in their own teaching around this framework, and we can see the teachers start thinking about lessons they've used previously and start thinking about ways to make it a discovery activity for their students. And so that's been really uh, very, very fun for me to work with this group doing that. Also what's happened is those lab activities we've developed around inquiry, the really, really fun ones, we've put into our introductory laboratory sequence. And so we've had this synergy where we've worked with these high school teachers and seen them go through the process of discovery and then been able to extend that back to our own undergraduates. So that's been very satisfying. We have a, a um, whoops. Uh, currently, we have a proposal in for a second phase of uh, math science partnership work, again with the uh, teachers from the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. And in this case, we're, we have put in a more rigorous experimental design to start to understand uh, the impact of our work with these high school teachers. And so our plan is to put them, again, into disciplinary cohorts and sprinkle in the faculty at case that teach these introductory courses. So we hope to establish some synergy between those faculty teaching those introductory courses and those high school teachers so they can have conversations about what do university faculty expect those high school students to do when they get to the university. Uh, what are sort of some ways to solve some of those thorny content pedagogical problems in teaching that might be shared across high school courses in introductory biology. And we have put in place an assessment plan where we hope to be able to do uh, learning gains and see if those high school students actually have some learning gains when they're in a class with a teacher that's participated in this particular model. And then we plan to follow those case faculty that participate and see if working in the summer with these high school teachers has um, any uh, type of impact on the way that they teach or interact with their students or reflect on their teaching experience. So that's a, a future project that we hope to carry out. The other thing I want to tell you about is a little bit of the uh, preliminary information that I have been gathering on uh, my introductory biology course, the cells and proteins course. So just a little background on this course. It's um, 
required for the biology major. It's t taught each fall. About 70% of the students in the course each fall, somewhere between 65 and 70% of the students are second year students, so it's really targeted at those sophomores. But it's only the second biology course that our majors take. So it really is still an introductory course, even though it's being taken by second years. And the students in the course are predominantly biology majors or science majors. And it's a big course, so somewhere between 280, 300 students or so each fall. In teaching this course over the past several years, I have introduced a number of in-class activities, case studies, problems for them to solve, discussions, sort of think-pair-share activities, and um, clicker questions that I use to make the lecture time period more interactive and less passive for them in class. And so the, one of the questions that I had a couple years ago that I really wanted to answer are what types of, of learning activities do students use that are actually impactful and can increase their student learning? So what do I mean by learning activities? Well, the things I decided to approach first off are pretty basic, all right? Going to class, uh, attending SI sessions. So here at Case, we have uh, supplemental instructors for courses, the SIs. These are undergraduates who've taken the course previously and done very well. These students attend the, attend the uh, class sessions and then hold review sessions a couple times a week for students that are enrolled in the course at any given time. Also, uh, students can choose outside of class time to visit their instructor during office hours, and maybe that would be something that would have an impact on their learning. And another um, uh, added sort of feature of, of this course is that we have uh, courseware, which courseware is a system whereby the lectures are, are videotaped and then uploaded to the web as, as uh, videos that students can access after the lecture. So these are just four examples of learning activities students can engage in that might impact their learning. So if you want to find out if they have an impact on a student's learning, you need some measure of success or some increase in students' learning. So in my uh, first pass at this, I, I picked uh, two things that I thought I could measure, and that was their course grade. And, and we can debate if course grade is really a good measure of what students have learned, or, or even if it's a good measure of student success. But in my first pass at this data, that's the, one of the indicators I've chosen. Also, their attitudes and their future plans to continue in the biology major or take other majors courses. And so this is a, a sort of a, a, it's not sort of, it's a survey of students at the end of the course. And so I have my own online survey instrument that I use to administer at the end of this uh, course to the students to get some information from. So what have I learned so far? Looking at those uh, learning activities, going to class, going to SI sessions, office hours, or, or viewing the online videos after class, the only one of them that is statistically significantly correlated with class success is actually going to class. And so I tell my colleagues this, and, and people say, well, of course. <laughs> and, and I think to some degree that's true. I, I think going to class, of course, we expect that that's gonna increase your learning gains. I think one thing about this finding is that our students might be surprised by that. And so I think it's important to share with our students that that's the number one correlation with being successful in class. I think class attendance is a tough thing though because a, a lot of variables go into whether or not a student attends class. And, and I categorized in my study course attendance as being there more than 70% of the class sessions. So some students miss sometimes. So you gotta be there 70% of the time. Um, usually students who are already motivated for the topic are gonna be there. So, so there is that variable that I can't separate out. Separate out. Um, so, so, you know, I need to sort of have a finer measure of what that class attendance actually really is indicating. Uh, the second thing is that most students that attend class, uh, or I'm sorry, I think that that's, uh, oh, that's correct. More students attend class and watch the videos than students who only look at the courseware videos. And so a, a few years ago when it was becoming more widespread on campus to use this Media Vision courseware to videotape lectures, I think a lot of faculty were really worried that as soon as those lectures were available online, course attendance would be 
drop off, right? Every, all this, especially, you know, I teach 930, not early for us, very early for students. Will they still come to class? Well, when I look at the data on who's attending and who's watching the videos, students who go to class a lot watch the videos a lot. Students who don't go to class very much don't watch the videos either. Now, a few watch the videos a lot, but that's a handful out of 300 students, maybe two or three. So based on that observation, I feel much better that students are not substituting the video of the class for actually showing up at the class. Um, as far as students' attitudes on um, their experience with the course and their interest to go on uh, in biology, Results have been very mixed, and I try and really sprinkle in a lot of in-class activities so students are challenged during the lecture period to actually think about something and do some things in class. The reviews on that are really mixed. Some students like it, some students don't like it. Um, so I just picked a couple of uh, comments to, to show you. Um, so I use clickers quite a bit. First student loves the clicker questions. Third student, Clickers are very bad, <laughs> so really mixed. So some people like the in-class sort of involvement thing, some people don't. Um, another student uh, likes the class and all of the activities work together because it makes it interesting, so that's really good. Um, other students, uh, they say, you know, why, why doesn't she lecture more and t actually teach me? So I've had students come up and in conversation say, but you're not teaching me anything. I have to learn this myself, and I think, hmm. Yes, that is the idea. You do have to learn this yourself. So, so the results in that uh, respect are quite mixed. But I think that my initial foray into, foray into collecting this data and thinking about these classes has really helped me make informed choices about things I'm going to do and also has helped me refine sort of the questions and the information that I continue to collect as we move forward. So at this point, I just want to say thanks to uh, Mace Mensch, who works in ITAC and has been instrumental in helping me sort through the data and look at the data. So we partnered on this particular project. Um, Anita was an undergraduate who has graduated now. So, you know, she's still around, just has graduated from Case, who really did the hard work of correlating all of the data for the conclusions I've drawn. Um, and Jim Bader and Cindy for organizing the panel and my other uh, panel members. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll take those. Yes. I do. And... Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting. I, I kind of expected the courseware data to come out and I would be able to divide students into four groups. So students who go to class and watch the videos, students who go to class and don't watch the videos, students who don't go to class and watch the videos, and then some people in between. But it turns out the number of students that actually um, um, go to class and don't watch the videos ever is really low. So what I've, been, what I've been doing is a finer analysis and dividing the students up into students who watch a lot of hours of the video and students who watch just once in a while. And uh, the students who watch a lot of hours, that really correlates with the students who go to class. So they're really using it the way that we would hope they would as a review tool. So you're in class, you saw something going on, but you wanted some more information, and you use the video to reveal to review that later. So I, I really felt much better about that whole system after I really looked at the breakdown of what these students were doing. We mm -hmm. have time for questions again after the, oh, all sure. the um, Thanks, Nancy. Uh, one of the issues in a research university is, of course, the tension on and the forces that exist on faculty members between research and teaching. And it's easy to be glib and say that you know good researchers are also the ones who are good teachers, but there's some indication that that's not true, that uh, efforts that go into research actually take away from teaching and vice versa. Uh, it seems like what distinguishes faculty is those research faculty who te look on teaching as also a research activity to investigate you know, what makes for good learning, who look on it more than just something that they have to do as part of their job, but say, you know, what is learning? You know, what, what goes into it? And you can see from Nancy's uh, talk that she is thinking about, you know, what 
are the factors that play a role in student learning and looking at it as a research question. And that's what makes them very good teachers, these researchers. Now, when I came here 20 years ago to the physics department, it was clear to me almost immediately that Bob Brown was easily the complete faculty member in what I call it. He did the research and he did the teaching. And he approached the teaching like a research problem. And you know, he was always trying out new things. And what impressed me most was when he first came was especially technology. He would seize on the new technologies. You know, at that time, email was a new technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would seize on it as a teaching tool. Say, so, you know, what, what, how can I use this in teaching? And so he was using email. And then the web came along. And he was always using stuff like that to teach and see how does that improve the teaching. Meanwhile, he had a very active research program going on. And he was writing these MRI textbooks. And now he has started a company based on that. So, he, And um, amazingly, in spite of all that, He's one of those guys who always seems to have time to just shoot the breeze in the hallway. You can you know, catch a hold of him and talk to him about stuff. And he seems to have the time to do that, which is kind of amazing. So as I said, Bob has always been interested in the use of technology in teaching. Uh, I, I don't know what he's going to talk today, but I, I wonder whether, I'm not sure that he uses Twitter as a teaching tool. Maybe he has. Maybe he has some ideas about how to do that. But anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce Bob Brown from the physics department. Uh, he has a B BS from University of Minnesota and a PhD from MIT. And he has pioneered a number of successful educational methods, and as a result, received four national teaching awards, along with the Dekoff and Witke Awards from CASE. Most recently, Bob has been working in physics education research, developing a cycling approach to education, where material is revisited several times during a semester. Professor Brown's research ranges from education research to industrial physics and astroparticle physics. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and is presently preparing the second edition of a 900-page textbook on MRI, which he has co-authored with his own students. Okay, Bob. So I'm old. <laughs> So that, that's it. But you know what? I, I want to tell you that the, the thing that's absolutely amazing, I, I would never have imagined this. But at this time, after all these years of teaching, uh, you know, so many different classes you know, and so forth, teaching is more interesting today than ever. Teaching is more interesting on this Thursday than yesterday. I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible thing. And I, and I want to tell you a little bit why. At least, um, uh, you know, and uh, interesting to a lot of us. So, um, what I want to do is, first of all, just mention to you that um, part of the reason, of course, is we're doing research. We're doing research in this relatively new field of PER, physics education research, and it's you know, so now it's a it's a field. Exactly like in, in research in our physics department, just like condensed matter, you know, astrophysics, uh, elementary particle physics, you know, so it has a, it's a track like that. You've got faculty, you've got students, you've got PhDs, you've got every, everything, you know, and, and it's just a, it's a terrific and an important and a wonderful thing, and it's part of the excitement of, of, uh, of teaching now today. So I thought it'd be fun to just give you an example of, uh, of a PER research project that we had and, and involving uh, uh, our, a number of our students. And along the way, of course, you know, Nancy has mentioned that, uh, you know, just this, this business about trying to come to conclusions and assess and, you know, and decide what's good, what's not good and so forth. You know, assessment challenges. Oh boy, assessment challenges all over the place. And but we'll have fun. Uh, besides, uh, you know, I'll mention uh, really quickly about the the assessment that we try to do on that PER example. I also um, will talk about our own assessment for clickers and for um, our cycles, just very briefly at the end when I have time. But there's there's one thing. You know, they always say you're not supposed to memorize anything. Uh, it's not good to just memorize. It's no, not good to just do, go through rote memory. But uh, there's a good memorization I just will leave you with at the end. No assessment needed. It's great. You want to do it. And I'll just, I'll just uh, tell you what in the world I'm talking about. Um, in, in PER, I just wanted to you know, just uh, 
broadly outline again, so you know, we're studying, teaching, and learning, then we're gonna compare different methods of, of you know, and, and you're gonna compare large lectures versus the, you know, small groups and all of these, these new kinds of, of uh, composite structures and, and modalities for teaching, and then we're gonna try to test it. You know, here's the number one thing. You, everybody knows this, Mono has taught me this, you know, everybody is very familiar with this, but I gotta say it anyway. You, you teach a class, you think you're doing great, you're really happy, everything is wonderful, and you go out saying, boy, that was really, that went really smoothly, and in fact, you know, the, all kinds of research is showing that you haven't engaged very, very much at all, in general, uh, in, in a passive, one-way kind of lecture, even with small classes. Well, um, you know, you, you want to look for new alternatives. There's, there's great things that we're learning from psychologists and then from technology, clickers. And um, I, uh, but I come back to the fact that what it really is, though, it's assessment. You know, uh, we're, of course, doing experiment. We're going to measure it and measure it again and see if we've reproduced it and then if we can come to some kind of conclusions from it. And, but that's the assessment that we've got to have, and uh, it's... Uh, really the, the central theme and the central challenge. Teaching is much harder than quantum field theory. <laughs> in, this, in this PER example, uh, we've got a, a, a couple of people who did this work with us as seniors and their capstone experiences. We have a couple of faculty in, involved and one of them, it's wonderful to say, I have to quickly tell you that she was she started with me in teaching introductory physics in 1988, and she's gone on, then she was a freshman. She went on to uh, get a PhD at a very, very uh, leading PER school, OSU, and, uh, and she's come back to sort of pull me in to try to do some of the things. She knows that we've been doing certain things that have value, and she wants to help us assess them. Well, in the definition of this, this problem, and now I can't read that, so I'm going to go look over here. Uh, we, here's, our, here's our problem. This is the thing that we, you know, we, we decided for some time, to, you know, we refer to this as the post-exam syndrome. Uh, can you hear me if I'm not standing by that thing? No. Oh, no. Um, so what I'm referring to is exam performance in the classroom, and for most students, even when they have a pretty good grade, there's something about it that, uh, you know, there's something about the exam that's probably distasteful. A common effect, pain and suffering and denial, symptoms. Students don't like to revisit the exam to understand deficiencies, let alone correct them. Symptoms, student regrets moving forward to new material when they haven't mastered the previous. Symptoms. The student dreads then thinking about the next exam, you know, with the same kind of experience, and then and the student's relationship with us, and you know, about the course are really icky. So the research hypothesis, and, and Sarah Larian wrote this out so beautifully that I just copied it from her senior thesis. By implementing a process where students are asked to review and correct their errors on conceptual exam material. The amount of knowledge obtained by interacting with an exam will increase. That's a, an hypothesis that we try to test with our, our research. Here's the, the, the procedure, the therapy. After getting their tests back, in this method, in this thing that we were doing before and now we're trying to test the efficacy of it, we ask the students to correct their mistakes discuss briefly why they made their original mistakes, discuss briefly why did they do what they did. And you know what? <laughs> that has been very important because over and over again we see where we were not clear in our questions. We weren't clear in our exam construction. And some students then have gotten more points because we realized there was a perfectly valid alternative interpretation of our question. And then hand that in as their next homework for which they get credit. This is then part of the educational process. The, experiment, the kinds of experiments that we did then was to uh, split the, the class into two groups, A and B. Both groups take the same initial exam. Group A reviews the exam. Group B does not. 
And then both groups are given a no penalty follow-up exam. This, is, this works out really well in, in recitations. And then we compare the results. By the way, one of the most important things you have to do, as you can very well understand in the, in the, in the medical world, you know, we have to have symmetry here. Ultimately, we cannot have anything that one group of students has, has benefited from not also be ultimately available for the other group. So we have to allow, we have to go through this process. We just invert the order, give a test and then have them review. Give a test and then have them do their corrections. Well, the research history, you know, we did this with five different courses over a period of years, big and small courses, uh, three different universities, and, you know, we had to, I had to learn all kinds of different statistics tools, you know, depending upon, you know, when, when you don't know what the standard deviation is, we, we, we mostly use the student t-test. And there's great difficulties in these. This is much harder than quantum field theory. You know, the, 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 the small classes, of course, mean small statistics. Uh, the follow-up tests have to be carefully designed. Uh, the results were sensitive to the time. What we really realized, we couldn't ask them to correct and understand and, and digest the stuff within one hour. We had to give them time. And uh, the multiple choice versus partial credit kinds of physics tests that we usually give were, you know, brought stark differences in how in the world we were going to be able to test this idea, this hypothesis. Then we had to keep the subjects in the dark somehow because we didn't want the two groups talking to each other, <laughs> but, you know, we couldn't really control that very much, but uh, luckily having two different recitations, it wasn't such a big problem. Uh, an example, result of one experiment. We did a t-test. Two recitations, looked at uh, post-exam quizzes, then the null hypothesis, you know, the, really the thing you're testing with a t-test, that, uh, that reviewing had no effect at all, uh, only had a probability of, you know, of 0.074, and that um, was kind of, that's kind of a, a, a conservative. Uh, we have other results where the probabilities were rather less than that, so that it was a fairly positive uh, conclusion that we were able to draw, and in fact, I'll just highlight that in a second. We, of course, I said, we publish, we present this stuff, American Association of Physics Teachers, there's a, uh, the physics teacher paper in press by Henderson and Harper and their conclusions, where uh, I'll just highlight two points that they make. They say, we have found assessment corrections to be a valuable aspect of our teaching, and then right in the middle is an important thing. Further, we have found that incorporating quiz corrections saves instructional time, since almost no class time is needed. You know, this is, a, this is part of it. The test is continuing to be part of your education, and, that, and the students start to look at that as an educational tool more. And that's, that's really, I think, worthwhile. And a number of our colleagues are using this now. They find it a very natural and important way to go over the exam. More assessment challenges. You know, the clickers, uh, a major force in our, in our community, and, and Corbin Cobalt has led us in this thing for years and years, and I just want to say that uh, Corbin is so good with the, he's, Corbin is so good with the, uh, the technology that we don't have the problem that you were able, you identified about the, you know, some of the, some of the ma machines are not working. Because so he, so as a result of that, he has had uh, incredibly good student response. Well, he, you know, he binned his hundreds of students for me to try to see if there was a correlation, and I could come up with a, an idea that, oh, well, maybe for people who don't use clickers, the zero on the left, compared with all the others that you might say, oh, wow, you know, people who use clickers might, you know, 95 out of 100 of them, you know, compared with those who don't use them, would maybe have a half grade increase or something like that, but of course, Corbin also teaches me that correlation does not mean causality. And, and the point is that people who are really religiously using the clickers and so forth are also the same people who are doing their homework and coming to class and doing all of the other things. And so, you know, there's, you know, it's fraught with peril to try to draw conclusions. Well, speaking of happy students, I just want to say cleanliness may be next to godliness, but happily may not be how we get to mastery. There are all kinds of interesting experiments by a lot of different people where they take two groups, they find, you know, 
they're comparing two different methods and they find a particular group is really doing well at the end of it. They really do well on the tests, but when they give questionnaires to them during the process, it turns out that in stark cases, the people who are gonna end up doing really well and have mastered things and have gotten a better level of critical thinking are not as happy as the others. <laughs> and we can talk about how in the world that all happens. Um, in general, the, the question really is that, you know, uh, student questionnaires are very necessary, very important, very helpful, but they're fraught with ambiguity. And um, I, won't, I won't mention any more details about the, the cycles other than the fact that that's our, our thing right at the moment that we're doing education, we're doing some research on, we're trying to assess. We're, what we do is, you know, we, 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 we take the whole course, take 15 week semester, take the first five weeks, do the whole course in simple fashion, then revisit it the next five weeks. Then revisit it a third time, the final five weeks. And there's all kinds of things to be said about that. But let me say that it's really hard for us to try to assess it because we, we, if we could run two courses parallel, that would be fantastic. We'd have one course in a traditional manner and then the other one with this cyclic manner and then we could find out. But you know, that's just not possible to do with our, our single big lectures that we have that we're working with. But at the present time, there's a, there's a lot of positive things about this. We've got seven lectures, 15 semesters, two universities involved. And what we're gonna try to do is use sort of like a Bloom's taxonomy where we'll try to measure the levels of critical thinking uh, by, I've got piles of final exams from a bunch of different years and we're analyzing them and trying to understand and see if we can measure and, un and see different levels of, of, of critical thinking that have been achieved. And that, that would be, I think, an important way for us to try to assess it. Well, finally, let me finish with uh, a situation where there's no assessment needed. It's a good kind of memorization. Can I tell my story? <laughs> Can I tell my story real quick? I, I, I have a workshop. I'm telling people about the, the cycle approach. I'm going to this workshop. I've never seen any of these people before, never met any of them before. It's in Washington, you know, it's in a national conference. I, this workshop has 30 people in it. It's about like the size of this room. And during the question and answer, or even before that, there was somebody way in the back raises her hand and asks a question. I say, oh, Mary Smith, um, please tell me, you know, uh, ask your question. And she says, Oh, I, I understand. She had a, a lapel. Uh, she had her a name label on. And she says, oh, boy, you've got fantastic eyesight. I didn't. I don't have fantastic eyesight. That's certainly at, at that distance. It was you know, more than 30 feet away. What did I do? I went, found the names of everybody who's going to be in my workshop, went to their websites, got their pictures, memorized. Their, it was fun. And you'll understand that it wasn't so hard for me to do this because for many, many, many years I've been doing this for my classes. Uh, my daughter would, I, I'd cut them up, make little flashcards <laughs> with, with their pictures and their names in the back. And that kind of, of, if you know the names of your students, you know, I know who you are. Enough said. <laughs> I, I could talk about that. And I just want to say, that this has been, this is, uh, so I had a lot of fun at this, and I eventually, of course, told them about But this is an honor, this is a nice little story in honor of Doc Ock, the, the late, beloved, the late, great chemistry professor who memorized students' names for hundreds of students. My, my biggest class was, you know, well, usually less than 100. He, he memorized them for hundreds of students, and it was really important to do that. So, uh, if only you guys had registered for this. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks to everybody. Yes. I, I want to know about the difference in, in, the, in the level of teaching in the 1890s, you know, 
No. Well, I, I will tell you that the the just the electronic the electronic benefits, the electronic assistance that we have is just incredible and it has really improved. And I can actually measure I, I, I'm going to confess to you there are not very many students here. I have actually measured some of this by giving the same problems on final exams because they were because when I give a final exam, I don't give the exam out. I don't give the solutions out, so they don't go floating around the campus or anything like that. So I can try to test that. So the answer is yes. And but let me just quickly tell you why. An example, email. When I first started using email, by the way, that's 1989. 1989, I was going around the country talking about email and everybody was looking at me and saying, oh, that's wonderful, but what good is it to us? <laughs> the thing about email is the following. I, I wrote out every night the kinds of things I would say to you if you came to my office asking for help, and I would write out this, what I call homework hints, homework advice, homework discussions for the homework, and I submitted it, I, I sent it out en masse to the whole class every night for the homework, or every week, depending upon when the homework was due. And that was a tremendous difference. It's a tremendous difference. And research has shown that this kind of homework advice is helpful and can be measured as giving, as making benefits in terms of raising grades of students compared with not doing it, because students who don't get help with homework, a certain fraction of them, don't do the homework. It is better to do the homework with help than to not do the homework you know, at all, of course, with no help. So I, I'd say the answer is quite definitely yes. Is that related also to the, the quality of books and the quality of lessons? Well, now that's another story. <laughs> well, let us talk about that maybe later, uh, books, textbooks. Let me get out of the way here. <laughs> Thanks. We, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, one of the things uh, that Bob mentioned is, uh, and both Nancy and Bob, is giving students time to think about what they have done and reflect on it and you know, build on it, which is something that actually happens, unfortunately, not enough. And I would like to uh, say, Bob, although he says less than 100, I think I know he does it, memorizes the names of students which, in classes of over 200, of uh, larger than 100 too. And Doc Ock, as he said, was phenomenal in this, and I was, you know, I, took, I thought this is a great idea because I have known that if you, you have to have a personal relationship with the students and knowing their names is a fundamental sign of respect you pay to the students and has an effect. And I tried it, but you know, it's not easy. And you know, I remember telling Doc Ock once, you know, how do you do this? I can't, I, 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 I max out after a certain while. I don't memorize all. He said, don't worry. If you get most of it right, all the other students think that you know their names too. <laughs> all right? <laughs> so that gave me some reassurance. But, so it is important. Uh, what the, in both Nancy and Bob emphasized the importance of teaching, uh, treating teaching as a research question. And that's really what is key. And one, one of the people, the organization that has driven this is NSF, which has re really put in a lot of effort into making learning into a research question. What goes into learning and how do we assess whether we are successful in learning? And we are fortunate to have it as uh, Jim Hamos from the National Science Foundation, who has been instrumental in many of these programs uh, involving education in the STEM disciplines. And he received his PhD in neuroanatomy neuro at, at the Ohio State University. And then he did postdoctoral work at the University of Pennsylvania and SUNY at Stony Brook. And then he was recruited to the University of Massachusetts Medical School to apply techniques of cell biology to the study of Alzheimer's disease. And in 1993, the chancellor of the medical school asked him to create an office of science education. And that sort of shifted his interest, I guess. And soon, uh, Hamos became intimately involved with the education reform initiatives in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 2002, he accepted a role as program director at the National Science Foundation, where he now helps to manage a broad national portfolio of projects. Okay, Jim. Well, thank you very, very much. It's, uh, it's great being here. Uh, you should all know that I was raised in Cleveland, so it's wonderful to come back and uh, have memories flood back, although I've, it's a long time since I, le I left here. But the, the memories come back right away. Um, I'd like to do three things today, and that is, one, uh, tell you a little bit about NSF and especially my director, the Director for Education and Human Resources. So one of the things that uh, 
that I always like to do, since it's one of the things I did when I, when I came there eight years ago, is sort of try to figure out what the place is all about. So demystifying it to everyone is, is sort of one of my goals when I come out and talk. Secondly, talk about a little bit about one program, the program that I'm, I'm especially involved in, the, the thing called the Math and Science Partnership, which is what Nancy talked about a little bit before. Give you a little bit of sort of what's learned, uh, being learned out of that program and, and try to relate that to what you're about. And then thirdly, finally, connect those two and say, uh, there are huge opportunities for all of you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really here, and I, and I flew in this morning, to challenge all of you to, to really uh, do what Bob and Nancy are doing, do it more, uh, ask them to do it more. There are huge questions still uh, that I, exist, I believe exist in, in STEM education, teaching, and learning. Indeed, uh, I moved my field from uh, neuroscience into teaching and learning kinds of issues when I found out this is just as intellectually rich as, as that was. And I never quite figured out what the brain is about, so now I'm trying to figure out what education is all about. So that's uh, hopefully what we will do. Uh, I do bring you a welcome uh, and, a, and a sort of a commentary from Cora Merritt, who's the second in charge of the building. And the, and the, re, uh, the reason that I brought Cora's picture here and this, this quote from her is that Cora really was brought, was brought to NSF uh, many, many years ago. She came originally to create one of our directorates called uh, Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences. She left and went on into back into academia at the University of Wisconsin, also University of Massachusetts in high-level positions. Most recently, she's come back into, she came back as the head of Education and Human Resources, and that's the place where all the education initiatives come out of EHR. But now, uh, just since January 20th, a momentous day, uh, she was in this country, she was raised to the second in charge of the committee. And we have a person, a very, very high level person that cares about education, uh, and, and I think the whole building does, as it always has, and even more so now with her being there. And she challenges us and says, we can't rest on, on what we're doing. Uh, that in all the fields of, of science, mathematics, engineering, and the related educational perspectives to them, there's much to be done. And itself itself has sort of four broad goals that it talks about. Uh, one is the whole notion of discovery. I mean, that, that's what we've been doing since the 1950s, stimulating the, the, the basic sciences uh, throughout and the education related to it. Uh, relating it to learning is another very, very, very important part. And since the founding of the foundation, it wasn't only about supporting uh, the, basic, the, the, the basic fundamental science. It also was about thinking about where are we going to get the future scientists, how, are they, how do they get there, how are they supported, and that's where the educational mission especially is, although all of the research directorates also think about this. We're also involved in the research infrastructure of this country. Most typically you think about the, the polar ships that, that we're, we send out or the major physics facilities, other varieties of things. In my venue, I think about partnerships as an important part of a research infrastructure as well. And then finally, uh, stewarding this whole process. This is sort of the inter internal NSF mission to itself of realizing that we need to move it together. And I want to convince you also that NSF is you. Uh, NSF is of the disciplines and, 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 and is that way. It's a two-way interaction. Uh, the, one of the major fundamental parts about NSF, people like myself, program officers, there are many, many people that rotate in for years, for one or two years, and then go back to their, their home institutions. Uh, you come in as reviewers, all, all sorts of interactions, as, as members of the committee of visitors. Uh, I was trying to convince Nancy beforehand. I said, come on, come on down for a year. Uh, we need you. So uh, the stewardship role and realizing that we, we are of you, you are of us, is, is something we're very much about. Now, EHR, the, the, the Director for Education and Human Resources, this is the place that fundamentally thinks about uh, excellence in STEM education. It does it at all levels. So you'll find we'll talk about K-12 levels, we'll talk about undergraduate, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about graduate education. We talk about understanding that we need to, to drive human capacity in this country. So you see in our goals, not only just simple tinker around with educational exercise, but you also have to actively think about things like broadening participation. You have to think about who are the students that are out there, who are the students being reached, who is not being reached, and again, at every single level, and try to create uh, uh, endeavors to solve those sort of things. So ESR's missions and his goals are constantly trying to create programming uh, by the program officers to, to do these sorts of things. These have turned into sort of five major themes most recently, and these, these themes are really uh, derived by Cora with the program officers when she, when she came in now about three or four years ago. And then you'll see on this that there is the broadening participation goal. There's also a commitment to K-12 teaching and teaching education, uh, teaching and learning. So thinking about the future teachers of this country, the STEM teachers in this country, is a central role of, of the, the foundation. You think, you see uh, aspects of thinking about cyber learning. 
So uh, we talked about uh, email. Uh, certainly, the country moves a little bit further in technology than email, but the real gifts of cyber learning and the study of that uh, still remains to be done. And there are a whole new initiatives just over the last couple of years that are trying to think of the cyber infrastructure of this country, not only how it's used for science, but how it's also used for learning. And then you also see that we have the role in research and education. So it's not just about implementing a whole bunch of little things. It's really doing some of the things you've heard about, the assessment exercise, and getting deeper and deeper and deeper in all those things. And in fact, when I, when I came in eight years ago, uh, I originally came to say, okay, so what do they do at NSF? And it's finally these series of things in our programs that I've, that I've learned is what we're all about. If you come into the building itself, uh, our floor, the eighth floor, uh, there is a, a, the, the head of it, this was core at the time, is the, was the assistant director. So each of the directorates at NSF has a, an assistant director, a pretty low level title for a person that really runs a, a huge, major, multi million dollar activity. But that's, that's who we are because they are assistant directors to the director and the deputy director. So there are eight of them, one deputy director and a director. Inside of EHR, we've created four different divisions. So you have the division on, on human resource development. This is really the place that that thinks about the broader uh, participation exercise the most, although all of us own it as well. We have a division on research on learning in formal and informal settings. That's the place that really drives the research on education in both the formal exercise, that is K-12, undergraduate, graduate, as well as informal museums, all sorts of other kinds of activities. The division of undergraduate education, where we're going to spend a, quite a bit of time thinking about those. And then finally, the division on uh, graduate education. So. Uh, how does all this come to, I mean, what does this mean dollars and why? How can you get a piece of this puzzle? Um, first of all, I can tell you, so in fiscal year 2007, the entire number was something just under $700 million was EHR. So EHR spending in, in 2007 was just under $700 million. And this was out of a total budget of the foundation of $6 billion. Now, $6 billion seems like a big number. Uh, when you come to Washington, one of the things you learned, you know, I was really happy when I used to get my little $5,000 in-house grant in my university. The numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger. $6 billion seems like a big, big number, uh, but in terms of federal agencies, it's a very small number. So it's, it's really interesting that the $6 billion has to do all of the fundamental, all the things I've been talking about for the last little bit already. So it's $6 billion, but about 10, 11, 12, 13% of that is this EHR activity. So it's a significant amount of the activity there. And you can see how it was broken down in 2007, roughly equivalently between those four different divisions. So what has happened just in, whoops, nope, I don't want to do that. What, what has happened just in the last few weeks? So the kinds of things you're hearing about, the, the current budget, we're all wondering about what the next budget's gonna be. Well, just in, since 2007 to 2009, so I just gave you two time points, our budget from the fiscal 2009 budget, the one we're just now giving out in, in, through all our programs, is now about $845 million, where the, the whole foundation's budget is now about $6.5 billion. So things are growing. There's a huge momentum in Congress and in the White House to really dramatically increase the amount of dollars flowing through NSF back to research grants and, and studies all over the country. So the exercise continues the amount of commitment to EHR continues very strongly also, so grab a piece of that. And then finally, even the stimulus bill, what, what, what is really the American Recovery and, and Reinvestment Act of 2009, that also, which was dramatically a huge infusion in the research directorates, so all the research activities, also for EHR had $100 million where, where, that we're putting out, especially in three different programs. One is the NOI Scholarship Program, that's for future STEM teachers. The other one, my, my program, the Math and Science Partnership Program. And a third one that's just being created around professional masters that we could talk about if, if you're interested in those ideas. So quite a significant amount, amount of dollars are, are at play here. So yesterday I went back and said, so what, what, is, what is Case Custom Reserve's piece of this pie? And, the, and this is the answer. So uh, NSF-wide, so for all the directors, for all of the, uh, you know, other than EHR, uh, Case Western Reserve has 102 different awards. That's pretty successful for about $44 million. So that's active awards committed to Case Western Reserve from the National Science Foundation and all the kinds of research activities. So that's, that's not bad. Um, when I looked and said, well, so, well what, uh, what do you, you get from EHR? What I found is five awards. Five awards for about $1.9 million. So uh, that's telling me that you, you have about 4% of 
of what case Western Reserve is going to get from NSF is in the educational activities. Uh, I'm here to convince you today why I flew from Washington, you can get more of this, and you should get more of this. You know, those of you interested in teaching and learning should be finding out the different kinds of programs and getting a piece of this puzzle. Um, also, Case Western Reserve was part of the Math and Science Partnership. The really, the major award there went to the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland School District. Uh, but out of that single uh, large grant, and that was a $7.5 million grant that played out over five years, with some parts still continuing to this time, Case Western Reserve out of that got $1.6 million. So that's not a bad piece of one large puzzle that, that many, some of you were involved in. So uh, that's, that's up where you're at now. Three of those awards are about to disappear, by the way. This is the end of them. So if by the end of the year, unless you get new ones, you only have two. So get more, please. <laughs> I want to switch to uh, undergraduate education and begin to tell you some of the specific kinds of programs you can think of in this arena. We could talk a lot about the other directorates, too, if you want to, but I really want to, to move here. So uh, the Division of Undergraduate Education is the one that really has the charge to stimulate many of our varieties of activities. The names of programs are a huge, long list. And if you saw on this list, so what you, the kinds of things you'd pick out, I'm going to talk a little bit more about CCLI, which is the one that really is the kind of course innovations that, that you've been hearing about. But there are many other kinds of programs. There are scholarship programs here, both for future teachers, for future STEM stu students, for future ones involved in cybersecurity, if you're, you have anybody on campus that is interested in those things. There are programs that try to change the, the undergraduate experience and, and support that. There are programs that ally you with the, with the workforce, especially if you're at all allied with two-year kinds of programs that may exist in the area and, the, and directly into the workforce. A huge list, and, and then some of the teacher education programs are here as well. So in this list are many varieties that you, that you could head to. I'm going to talk about two. Again, my program, the Math and Science Partnership Program, and then really focus on the course curriculum and laboratory pro one is, is a huge opportunity. So the Math and Science Partnership, um, Nancy stole a little bit of my thunder. She mentioned it already. This is a large program. Uh, it's a program that started in fiscal year 2002, uh, and that's really when I came to the foundation, so I was one of the founding program officers for it. It's really, uh, while many of the interventions are, are around improving K-12 uh, learning, K-12 student achievement, it turns out that it's a huge research and development activity that impacts is made, uh, higher education is a uh, significant uh, level as well. We impacted Nancy. She just said that. I love that. That's a, that's, a, that's a data point for me. And I look for those sort of data points all over the country. It'll probably be one of our highlights next, next year. So uh, it turns out, and you're, you're going to hear about some of the direct impacts on undergraduate education today, not the ones that are at the K-12 level. Uh, it's one that Congress is incredibly interested in. I mean, what you're going to find is that the Math Science Partnership Program had increased funding in uh, the American Competes Act of 2007, the stimulus bill supported it again. So uh, we're sitting around doing our business. All of you, the ones involved in Math Science Partnership, are doing your business. And Congress keeps on saying, well, you know, we have wars, we have this, we have that, we have all these issues to resolve, but make sure MSP gets a little bit more every single time. So uh, we hold ourselves to a very, very high standard of pushing, pushing, pushing. Uh, I want them to do more. My colleagues that are here, so it's Jim, it's Bill Batter, it's Nancy, do more because we're spending a lot of your tax dollars. So uh, a lot is happening out there. At the core of MSP, uh, what you find are partnerships. So it's called the Math and Science Partnership. We've been pushing for partnerships between universities and school districts as a start, but all the varieties of players play out in different kinds of partnerships, no matter where you are in the country. And I'll give you some statistics on these in a moment. But the centerpiece is a, at least an institution of higher education and one school district well, we, one we mentioned here is Cleveland with three universities and colleges. Um, the, uh, I have an example of, of one with you know, 13 higher education institutes, 46 school districts, and other ones that are one-on-one. -on -one. So there are many, many flavors, and state educational agencies get involved, museums, what, what have you. Um, what distinguishes this program more than any is that we are specifically trying to stimulate the disciplinary faculty into this work. So this is not just the same, let's figure out what to do better in education, and, the, and, the, and the, the, what, how it, however it evolved in this country, it's specifically trying to bring in the scientists, mathematicians, and engineers into the work and trying to figure out what can they contribute. So there's no a priori proof that that will do anything. So we're studying that. But, it, but it's a very deliberate part of bringing them in, um, getting them involved in issues like educational research. In addition, um, we push for innovation. So it's not just doing the same old what you think is the right stuff. So pushing, 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 and that's hard. 
I mean, innovating education, thinking something different is not, not trivial stuff. Um, we push on the point of partnership. And I have data about the Cleveland one that I can tell you about. What are the people partnering at the beginning when they got all the money? And where do they think now about partnership and what do they learn? So we're trying to learn about the whole notion of partnership, which turns out to be much easier said than done. So many of us, many of us have been part of collaborations, cooperatives, whatever in the past. Being a partner is not simple, so we're studying that. Um, the idea of evidence, study, study, study everything you're doing. It's not only about the poor, needy kids and how much you want to improve their lives. It's about studying everything you need to do be before that. So it's changing higher education. I want not only the data point about Nancy, I'm going to know, how do I know this? <laughs> you know, and a lot more. Um, and then finally, uh, we don't think these things are normal stuff. So we really think about the notion of institutional change as well. So if you prove to yourself the partnership is important, then how are you going to change the way you do work? when NSF's money leaves, and, it, and that's up to the partners to, to figure out. So what have we done over the years? Well, this is uh, about 119 funded activities. We've spent out about $700 million to this point. Okay, so a lot of business already invested in these, these projects. Uh, all sorts of different flavors. I'm not going to go through them with you, so there are different varieties of these kinds of these partnerships with these names on them. Um, and we've done them in different years. As I've left Washington, I'm in the middle of decision-making process for, for this fiscal year. So we're right now determining some of the, the, the future grants that we're going to give. If you look at and see where these are all over the country, uh, over time now, so you do this for four, five, six, seven years, and you begin to fill in much of the country. I can't tell you that we've impacted every single school district in all those blue states, but we are doing some subset of districts in those states. So the reach of the program by now is, is reaching out, and some of the decisions we're about to make is going to be coloring some of the white ones, which are the places we don't have any MSP activity into blues pretty soon. The numbers are there are now about 800 school districts, and this is rural, suburban, urban, all the varieties that exist in this country. There are about 5 million students just in the project sites themselves, the places where the, the, the keenest activity is, so there are a good number of students. About 147,000 teachers have been involved in different kinds of professional development and creation of new teachers. Uh, we've been able to stimulate with these dollars 198 institutions of higher education to think about this. So they're in the experiment, and lo and behold, you put out the dollars and you push the, the emphasis that you have. About 20, uh, 600 faculty, graduate students, administrators in higher education are now in our data banks on this. So we're studying them. So this is sort of the, the reach. Um, a quick note about Cleveland. Again, Nancy, you, you, already, you, you sort of said it. So, so Cleveland was one of these. It was one of the, one of the ones in the very first cohort where we only funded 20-some projects. Um, so we really went out in the, in the first round. And there you have uh, the, the school district, now the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. You have John Carroll University. You have Cleveland State and uh, Case Western Reserve University. I've been the program officer for this project since the, since, uh, the beginning. Uh, and I've been watching them. I think they've learned some stuff. I think, I think they have learned stuff. We meet in meetings. I've done site visits here. And some things are being learned and some things are being shared. Um, the kinds of things that are being done in Cleveland. So, so those of you who haven't heard about this should be wondering what's happening in this. Uh, again, Nancy, uh, she, she at least sells the idea that she learned something out of this. Uh, why would you get involved in these sorts of things? Uh, the kinds of th the focus of the Case Western Reserve part with Cleveland was really thinking about the whole notions of inquiry, not a simple thing in in K-12 science education, so what is inquiry? Trying to think about really laboratories and problem-based exercises, trying to get teachers who aren't teachers. I mean, one of the amazing things to me as a scientist is I, as I, I've worked with many, many teachers who love science, but they've never done science. So until you bring a teacher into a classroom and say, this is what, or into a science experience, say, this is what science is all about, where it's really open-ended, where it's not about all those little, little facts, and this is where the love and beauty of it is, then they're never going to be able to pass that on to their students. So doing that sort of thing becomes very, very important. Um, there have also been, uh, you know, th th I think the partnership has learned one of the major lessons, something I'm going to show you some data on from another part project in a moment, is that you can't just do this as drop-in workshops. So if you're going to commit to this, you have to do very concrete, long-term sort of things over summers where most people have the time to do sort of these sort of things, as well as touch base during the school year as well. So there's academic follow-through, and, and the partnership has done this with uh, faculty and residence programs at the schools and other, other sorts of things. And then finally, you've been also loaning some things. Now, 
I, I looked at the last year's annual report, so I, I, I read it years ago, uh, not years ago, months ago, but I reminded myself, so what are, they, what are they learning out of all these things? And one of the things that I pulled out of this is that they've learned that, um, that this is not simple stuff, just trying to figure out what is it they really want kids to learn? What is a challenge to students? And not only Cleveland students, I think they're learning this about all students. What would be a challenging course that's meaningful as they move through the K to 16 experience is something this project was learning. And you don't face that until you really try to do the kinds of teacher professional development and, and activities. Um, they've also learned that, that um, the, this piece that, that strength, there's a constant dichotomy of, you know, we're instructors, we know our science, we want to really get the, the teachers to understand the, sci the science, but the teachers constantly want to know what is the activity I can bring back to my classroom. So there's this constant struggle between those two. And you have to sort of give ground on, on pieces of it because teachers, they think that after a while, if they say that it's only about me and nothing comes from my classroom, they'll want, begin to wonder, the system will wonder. So you have to wonder about how does it translate. But at the same time, you're tremendously trying to, to, to ramp up um, deficiencies in, in science and learning as well as, again, the inquiry process. So Cleveland, Cleveland is learning those things. What I want to generalize, though, is even broader things from the whole national program. Some really things that I think have specific impacts on undergraduate education. So uh, by this point, $700 million into it, lo and behold, these projects over time, uh, and I'm not going to give you all the details of these, so I mean, we're not reading these things to you at all, are, are really beginning to contribute to something about teaching and learning, uh, especially teacher professional development. Uh, there is a great website by one of our, our grants that if any of you are interested in teaching and learning and saying, what do we know about this? What have we learned about it for 20 some years, 50 some years? And what is MSP contributing to it? This website is really taking the empirical uh, understanding of what's known in the field and all sorts of dimensions of teacher content knowledge, teacher leadership, and saying, this is what's known. This is where there's huge gaps. This is where MSPs are beginning to contribute. And believe me, we are pushing our projects to contribute further. So if those of you are interested in those kinds of transfer issues, this is an incredible uh, resource. Um, we've learned, and again, this is one of the things that the Cleveland Project has learned, is that you have to create structures of, of interactions with teachers. If you want to teach um, teacher content knowledge and, and then something with students, you have to, ch to do, do concrete long-term programs. That's what I mentioned before. Quite often, this is something on the order of 80 plus hours in a summer with a, a, a ongoing activity. And it's only when you begin to do that that you get the, the transference. So the kinds of data points for this, on the, on the top you actually see, uh, this is a project out in, in Western Washington University, so it's up in, in Washington State. Um, this particular project has been able to demonstrate that a, a set of courses, lo and behold, over time, the different varieties of teachers can improve uh, teacher content knowledge, so that's the top slide. And then the bottom slide shows that students that have a teacher that has this for one, or two, uh, uh, that they have a, if a student has a, uh, one of these teachers for one year or two years, their content, their, their learning gains are, are greater as well, while students that don't uh, stay flat. So it's, it's this long-term kind of meeting. Um, I think Nancy's a great example of this next one, but this is an example that, that that higher education can begin to change when it begins to encounter this relationship with teachers in the K-12 world. They, they, they do begin to think about their own pedagogy. And our program evaluators, so these are evaluating the whole program nationally, have found 300 plus cases. So we had our biology example here. Uh, and Bob, I don't think, were you, were you funded at all by, by, by the MSP, the, you were all related? No, but I, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> oh, okay, well that's another piece. but. So I, I, can only use the, uh, I can only use Nancy as the example here. But um, the point here is that 300 plus university courses all over the country have begun to get changed. I'm gonna show you some data on this in a second too. And that uh, lo and behold, the kinds of student engagement pedagogies are the kinds of changes that are being done. So it, it is clickers, it's just-in-time teaching, it's studio physics and chemistry, it's, it's peer-led team, uh, team uh, leadership. So it's those sorts of things that are the kinds of changes that are happening. Um, what sort of things do you, if you begin to believe these things, how do you begin to create the institutional change structures? Lo and behold, our projects are creating centers, sort of like the center that you have. I mean, places where faculty come and talk about these things, they explore things, they challenge themselves. And it's only when those kinds of centers become permanent structures are the opportunities both to drive change, but also, remember, to get money. 
So we'll, 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 we'll talk about those sort of things. So these sorts of centers, and the, and the example that's shown here is really um, an example in, in the greater Philadelphia area where they're becoming a nonprofit entity to really tie together K-12, a whole series of metropolitan colleges and universities, a, a science center, and the business community into a permanent structure that has the capacity to support the change. And then finally, the holy grail. If you think this is important, you've got to think about the reward structure. That those of us that are in the STEM disciplines this is not what we were trained for, and all of a sudden you're beginning to say, well, this is a good thing. <laughs> so thinking about it and figuring out where does it stand in the reward structure. Is it only about service and outreach sorts of activities, which is a very low level thing? It's, it's sort of the way I started naively 20 years ago. It felt great, no evidence that it ever changed anything, to really ramping this up to some point where it could, do, it could promote change. And the example I want to show you here is the University System of Georgia that, that really has institutionalized everything from a department level up to a regents level uh, level of change that, that validates and actually encourages the scholarship of teaching and learning, the scholarship of service, the scholarship of engagement. It's exactly what you said, that it's, it's only when you get into thinking deeply about it and, and moving to a scholarly place where we think that those of us in academe will accept these sorts of things. And the University of System in Georgia examples has impacts both at the university level and the K-12 level. So here's the higher education level, uh, where it shows you that they've really institutionalized a whole series of regional and statewide institutes on teaching and learning. So these are places where faculty come together, they, they think about the cognitive science, they think about students of the 21st century, they argue about them, and they also have a mini reward structure that, that, that uh, um, I'm sorry, a mini grant structure that gives small pots of dollars for faculty to, to, to conduct change experiments in their, in their classrooms. And lo and behold, you find if you look through these sets of data, that if you compare the schools, that the colleges and universities in the system that are part of the project and those that are not, students begin to perform better on the common metrics that are used in the, in the entry level introductory courses. And what you're seeing here are, are percent passage rates on, uh, passage rates, ABC rates in, in those universities. You play this out at the K-12 level, and this whole convoluted set of slides, lots of information on it, I sort, of, I sort of give these out, but quite often the sets of slides end up in repositories, so we will give them. I don't know if the, the, the program has it here. But um, the data that's shown here is that uh, brings the, the whole notion of learning communities into the K-12 arena, and then says, what happens when you bring in a higher education faculty member into that environment? And what you find is that teacher-led learning communities that have higher education faculty involved with them have greater... Um, usages of the whole notion of inquiry embedded in them than the others that are not, more usages of what would be broadly billed as reform practices, and then lo and behold, the bottom sets of data shows on state na on statewide data that lo and behold, bits and pieces that the prism districts begin to perform better and better and better over time, the students in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in those districts. So this whole large-scale change there, all, all variety of institutional types begin to have impact. So that's MSP. Where do I want to leave you? Um, I especially want to point out one program in the Division of Undergraduate Education. This is the bedrock program that the division loves, where it truly believes it has its greatest impact on undergraduate education, but most recently has coined the term that it wants to transform um, undergraduate education. So it wants to truly change it beyond the small little bits and pieces that about 5 10% of the nation tries but the rest continues on business as normal. And I can tell you that the physics education community is by far the, the furthest afield in, in, in doing true educational research than any other community that, that exists in this country. So CCLI is really the place that, that, is, that has a whole series of things. If you look in the solicitation, it's an active program that right now has an open call inside of it. It has opportunities at every single packed portion of undergraduate education. So it could be changing courses, it could be doing faculty uh, professional development, it could be bringing in new instrumentation, just a whole variety of things. And in particular, the program now is looking for things that will truly be paradigm shifts. This is hard stuff. When I talk about transformative education, everyone thinks they're changing. That's not transformative. I mean, most, most change that many of us are trying, even in science, as well as in our classrooms, are small iterative slight kinds of changes that others have tried and we're trying to build on. Transformative change is a paradigm shift at, 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 the, at the extreme. 
So when, when someone takes an idea and somehow really pr pr produces a new, new activity, uh, well, CCLI would like to stimulate that. Finding the opportunities and the ways to do it, um, especially in the arenas of cyber learning and using the cyber infrastructure are very keen ideas that don't often get played out in, in good research grants to us. So think about those. There are multiple components in CCLI, so you don't have to do all of that. So if your interests are most in, in new, new curriculum materials and learning materials, you can do that. If you want to take some, some instructional strategies that are out there, you can try those kinds of approaches. If you want to really build up faculty expertise and fund that kind of activity, that could be done inside of CCLI. Um, if you want to think about how do you even assess student learning and give a new, develop new, new assessments, that could be funded at CCLI. Um, if you want to do other kinds of research on undergraduate STEM education, that also is, is, can be done inside of CCLI. And then finally, the last note at the bottom by the creators of this particular slide, yes, it's okay to buy equipment. So if you think equipment is fundamental to the work of an undergraduate classroom, you can buy that in a CCLI project. There are three types of CCLI from the most basic one. This is really the tinkering level. So this is something where you want to try something in a classroom. You get 200,000 uh, 200, over uh, two years to, to do that sort of work. Um, it doesn't have to be novel necessary. It could be trying to take someone from someone else. You want to do it in your classroom. You create a bit of evaluation around it. Um, there are activities right now. The deadline is May 21st. Uh, nope, you're in the state of Ohio, so that's May 22nd. Okay, so that's why it's separated. Um, some of you should have five weeks to go out and write CCLI proposals. Remember, C case, case only has five funded EHR projects. Two of them are CCLI projects. One of them, at least one of them is, is ending, maybe two, maybe both are ending, I forget. Um, if you're all interested in, in uh, allying with a community college or two-year school, the, the award can be up to 250000 So th those are type one projects. Type two projects are really um, where there are um, the, an idea that's out there that can be studied in, in, a, in a better level. So these are, are up to 600000 for two to four years, so they're larger. They're not due until January, so you have more times. If you already have an intervention you think is useful, it can be studied further. Uh, that's what CCLI t Type 2 is about. And then finally, if you think you're part of the network of people that really have an idea and the, and the nation is missing and, and, and dissemination is important and you want to conduct the experiment about how to spread this dissemination, you already have huge sets of data that you and colleagues have worked on, a CCLI Phase 3 projects, and there are only a, a handful of them that's funded in any given year. Uh, those are due also in January. And uh, this is the place to do it. So at a minimum, Continue, those of you who are interested in undergraduate change should be looking for CCLI. There are all those other programs. I'm going to stop now so we have time for questions. And uh, I hope to see many, many proposals from CASE and many funded proposals from CASE. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I think all your mics are live, so you can address questions to any other panel members. Go ahead. What are your ideas? <laughs> There's a mic there if you want. Hello? OK. Um, just to give you a bit of background, I am a fourth year undergraduate, hopefully graduating in, in about a month. Um, and so I, when I came to Case, I kind of jumped around from major to major. I started in computer science, went to biology, um, I started in computer science engineering, so I took, I took undergraduate physics class, went to biology, so I've taken two of your, um, well, I, I, I took your cells and proteins, I did the clear questions, I experienced the cyclical physics teaching cycle. Um, and one thing I, I, also I'm in psychology right now. Uh, one thing I noticed is when I, between the fields, it seems like there's quite a large difference in learning style um, and just, um, yeah, learning and style approach to learning in, uh, with regards to the students be we, between the different disciplines. Like psychology is very different from biology. Biology is different from physics. Um, that's what I experienced at least. So in terms of assessment, I was wondering, um, have you tried to sort of separate your students into different groups based on what's their motivation for doing this? I mean, you could do it in terms of like, levels of intelligence, um, you know, 
I don't know. I'm, I guess that's up in the air how you would do that, but uh, I'm, I was just wondering if you had thought about that at all. Thank you. Well, um, actually, I, I, I once did the following thing. There are these different learning styles that people have, divergers and convergers, you know, lots of different ways in which people approach things. And I have my own learning style, you know, and so I had fun seeing how the people did who were not my learning style, you know, and the people how they did who were the same as, as mine. And, and um, I, guess I'm, I guess it was a win-win thing because I was happy to say that um, f for all the people who, you know, that, that, that were all, all the different styles, that there wasn't anything, you know, there wasn't any, any bias, <laughs> there wasn't anything that looked like it was, if you compared this with other courses, with other performances, with other studies and so forth, there wasn't any, but any group that was in, that was um, doing more poorly than sort of national norms on, on these. There, there are certain ones who are more comfortable with math and physics and so forth than some of the other learning styles. And what I'm happy to say is that my own style uh, was a little bit anomalous and uh, not necessarily belonging to the group <laughs> that was um, the typical uh, engineering physicist. And, um, and I was happy to say that that group seemed to do a little better than, uh, than I would have expected you know, from national norms. <laughs> and so there, there is that. That's a lot of fun to look at that. And the students really enjoy it if you tell them about these different learning styles, the learning approaches, and tell them uh, that you're testing that and then to give them the results. It's really a lot of fun. It's, it's very nice. But I've never been able to clearly say, oh, this means I should teach differently. So actually, I share your same question. So in the course I teach, there are 300 students, and uh, mostly second year students, but they're not 300 biology majors, as you well know. They're students that are spread across many majors. And so I have had the question, I want to look at student outcomes depending on their interest, as at least indicated by their declared major. And I've run into two problems in doing that. Uh, many first semester second year students have not declared a major. And so in the data that I have available, I can't sort out who's what major. Uh, for those that do, it's actually incredibly diverse. In, in my biology class, I have students from almost nearly every undergraduate major, save some of the uh, weatherhead, some of the weatherhead. There are econ majors in the class. And what happens then is you have a really small number of students in each group. So it becomes really difficult to have a statistically significant number of students that say represent the econ major or the history major or so on. But there's definitely uh, different motivations of the students coming into the class. And I'm trying to think of a way to address that question. But it's, it's, it's a great question. Thank you all for being here. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the research showcase. Thank you so much. Thank you.